Hi there. Welcome to my channel once again, The Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation. It's a privilege to be able to minister to the bride. And um, my prayer today is that we will enjoy the Word of God, that we will sit with hearts prepared to come and hear what the Spirit wants to say to us personally. And that includes me, um, because even in, in my speaking, the Spirit is ministering to me as well. So I just want to be receptive as well to what He wants to say. Before I get to the devotional, I just want to mention that on my um, blog, the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation blog, you will find a, a, a page that has free PDF books that I've written that you are welcome to download in the search engine. If you are to type in the name of a book, you'll find a separate page that has the audios with it as well. Not every book has an audio with it, but uh, certain ones do. So you're welcome to help yourself with that, to pass it on. I've freely re I've received and most definitely freely I give all for the glory of God. So also my telegram link that you will find in the description box of this YouTube video. Um, you are welcome to join there if you if you wish to do so. Okay, so this uh, devotional teaching is called the Comforter, and the first time we read about the Holy Spirit is in Genesis one. So let's just read the first three verses of Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the earth. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, whenever we hear the word water, in the Word of God, it, the general connotation to water is uh, a multitude of people or a sea of people. For instance, when we read in Revelations that the beast will come out of the sea, it's not that the beast or the Antichrist will come out of um, the literal sea, but it will come out of man. So it will be a man. And the other thing is that um, we ourselves are made of water. We're 70 or 72 or 75 percent water and we cannot live without water. So the interesting part here is that the earth was here void and dark and the Holy Spirit was on the face of the water, the surface, that is what that face stands for. And when I was meditating upon the scripture, um, my mind went to conception that the moment conception takes place in a mother's womb um, there is at that moment of conception studies have shown there is a spark of light so when I read this and God said let there be light and there was light my mind goes to this conception of life in other words light equals life so the Holy Spirit is the one that is the life within us. And it's the life that upholds all things created by the Spirit of God. So the Father spoke the word, which is Yeshua, and the Holy Spirit brought the life. Okay, so when you think of Adam and Eve, um, they were told that they were not allowed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as we know. And obviously they didn't obey. And the father said to them that the moment they do take of that tree, that they would die. And as we know, they didn't fall right at that moment to the ground and die, but that it was a gradual death. But we do know that a death did indeed take place in that instance. And that is that the glory of the Lord departed from them. They went from eternal beings to beings that would die. And they no longer had that intimate connection, that inward connection with the Spirit of God that dwelt in them. But they went and they hid themselves. They were ashamed. Their eyes were opened to see their true state and they hid themselves. And whilst they were sowing fig leaves, the Father was walking in the garden calling out their names. Now, I believe that they could literally hear him speak to them. Whereas probably 
before that, the unity amongst them was as such that they didn't have to have to literally hear him speak. So they went from the spiritual to the natural. They went from living by the spiritual to living by the natural or the flesh. Now in Ephesians 5 verse 14, we read, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So they went into a spiritual slumber, almost like the earth that was void and in darkness. And then the spirit comes, and on the surface of the water comes and, and touches their hearts. Kind of like when we were not saved, we're not born again. Our, our own lives were like this earth. And then when the Spirit comes and hovers over us and touches our, 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 our innermost being, those deep calling unto the deep, um, that's when the Father comes and He speaks light. And the incorruptible seed of the Word of God is sown into our heart by the Spirit. And there's that spark of light, which is a spark of life. That's literally what happens in the Spirit. So the natural, what happens in the natural in a mother's womb, Father was using that to show us what is happening in the spiritual as well. And of which Genesis 1 testifies as well. So a new dispensation, that you know, the Old Testament is the previous dispensation, where the Holy Spirit was on the face of the waters. But in the New uh, Testament, it's a new dispensation. And the first time the Holy Spirit is mentioned is in John 4. Well, it's mentioned in the other Gospels, but in the book of John, it's mentioned in John 4 the first time. And this is when Yeshua met the woman at the well. She, every day at noon, she had to take a water pot and she had to walk because the well was separate to, to the community. So at a certain time, the woman went and they would go and fetch the water for the day. Now this lady went during the noon day, which was afternoon, so it was hot. And she would walk all the way and get every day, she would go get her water there. And she met Yeshua and Yeshua told her that if she knew who was standing right in front of her, she would ask him for water. And that he would give her water and that she would never be thirsty because this water will be living water and it will be as a well within her. So clearly we see that from Genesis to John 4 in the New Testament that where the Holy Spirit was on the surface or the face of the water, now the Holy Spirit is the well within her. He is now the source within, and she will never thirst again. And Yeshua tells this woman, he tells her that the Father is seeking those who will worship him, the true worshippers, who will worship him in spirit and truth. So the mere fact that he mentions true worshippers means there can be false worshippers. Now, the inclination is to think of song and devotional worship. We put music on and worship Father. But this is not what Yeshua meant. Yeshua was talking about the spirit within and that we are those who worship him, that truly worship him, worships him in spirit and in truth. The spirit of God is the spirit of truth. Right? So Yeshua was saying to her, the Father is seeking those who no longer live from the well of the Old Testament law no longer live from having to try and get living water because she could get water out of the well but she was obviously tired and daily she had to get this water out next day that water was done with she had to again come and get walk the same road do the same thing and get the water out he was talking about the water within from which now we are to live from. And in the New Testament, the water is now within us. Now we no longer live by the law, but we are under grace. 
So in Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2, we read, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water sprouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. I'm reminded of this, uh, one verse that David also said. He said, Lord, all my springs are shut up in thee. What is your source? What is your source? From which well are you living from? So in John 14, Yeshua tells his disciples that it's expedient that he should leave. And they were upset because he just told them that he's going away. I can imagine how that must have felt for them, growing so close to him, the amazing miracles, and out of the blue, he just tells them that he's going to leave them. And they were sad, and he said to them, but you're now sad, but afterwards you're going to rejoice because you're going to do greater works than what I what I did. And I have to ask at that point, you know, what is greater than raising the dead? And the answer to that is many raising the dead. Because the same spirit that was in Yeshua is now in his body. In every single one of us, not divided into us, but the same measure that was in him was in each one of is in each, each one of us. I have just the same amount of the Spirit of God in me as the Son of Man, and so do you. We need to meditate on these statements. We need to take them in, really think about it. And when we do think about it, we need to ask ourselves relevant questions about our own lives, if that is then true. So, the first time Yeshua introduces the Holy Spirit to um, the disciples about the fact that the Holy Spirit will fill them. He introduces them, uh, introduces, introduces the Holy Spirit to them as the Comforter. Now the word Comforter comes from G3875 in the Strong's Concordance and it means Intercessor, Consoler and Advocate. I found that interesting that Father God decided my children need to know that I will comfort them. It says a lot about his heart. So in John 16, Yeshua talks a bit about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit will do. So I just want to read that section, just three verses from verse 13 to 15. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. I think in John 14, um, Yeshua also said that the Holy Spirit will not speak or bring any attention to himself. He will constantly point to the Father and to Yeshua. So, once we have received, once we are born again, we are no longer under the dispensation of the law, but we are under the dispensation of grace. And so, when the disciples came to Yeshua and asked them which of the laws are the most important, he told them that there are now two new laws that are actually the fulfillment of all the laws. So he was saying to them that not one of these laws will fall away, but there is a new way of fulfilling it. And that new way is through grace. Now grace in itself, it's not just the grace that God extends to us to be saved. Grace is also the ability of God to give us the power and the wisdom and the strength and everything we need in a given moment to fulfill the law at all times. Once again, from which well are you drinking? 
So Yeshua tells them, the new law, there are two. So you will love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. The second one is just as important as the first one. We forget that very important statement. And he said that you will love your neighbor as yourself. This is the whole of the law. Now, our problem is that we struggle to fulfill that law. And somehow we can know the truth, but because of either cognitive dissonance of a veil that very often needs to be lifted, we can very easily parrot a truth, but not necessarily, necessarily live in the reality of it. And we need to understand that when the Lord says that in 1 Corinthians 15, let's read that in verse 45, it is written that the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So immediately what you have here is the, new, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Adam, Old Testament. Last Adam, New Testament. Old Testament, living soul. New Testament, quickening spirit. And so we find that we were made in God's image, but we all come from the lineage of Adam. So we are living souls as well. Now what constitute a living soul? Living soul constitute everything that you are as a person. Your personality, your talents, um, your quirks, your humor. Um, your personality type with regards to whether you are a very serious person, a funny person, a gregarious person, um, deep, uh, artistic, your talents, even your ethnicity. None of these things are going to fade away. That is who he made you and he made you fearfully and wonderfully. That is what he chose for you. And he wants you to celebrate that because you're going to celebrate that forever in the kingdom of God. So that is who you are going to be. What is going to change is your body. In the meanwhile, all these things, your emotions, your intellect and your, um, your knowledge and your personality, and all of that is what you have been living from. Your well. When you were born, the word says in Psalm 51, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and sin did my mother conceive me. And then David flips it around. He says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt cause me to know wisdom. So David was saying here, yeah, When I'm born, I'm born in iniquity, and in sin I am conceived. So from the get-go, we drink from the wrong well. And when we are born again, we are then under the new dispensation of grace. And now we have to live by the Spirit. So the problem is the transition from the one to the other and consistency and that that must be complete. Because we do not want to drink from two wells at the same time. We only want to drink from one. So this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. Because it's the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. Yes, we are sanctified with the blood of Yeshua. We are um, justified. But sanctification is as much a position as a process. So the process is getting all of the soul under the control of the Spirit so that you no longer live from your soul your emotions, you no longer live from your understanding or your intellect. It doesn't mean you become a zombie and you can't think for yourself. It means all of these things are personality. I know that there's many life coaches out there and they teach you about weaknesses and strengths of your personality. Well, that weakness is called sin, right? It's called sin because there's ever either fear involved with it or there's either pride involved with it. So your personality has to be sanctified. Your talent has to be sanctified. Your uh, humor has to be sanctified. Your emotions. 
no matter how valid they are, because Father made us to be able to be angry, sad, um, even fear is a natural um, uh, emotion, because we have, without fear, we won't have the response of fight or flight. Um, so I'm talking about a realistic fear, not one that is instigated by the enemy. All of these things, all that pertains to your life. Now I'm just talk talking about you, your, you as a person, as your soul. What also needs to be sanctified is everything that your life touches, your marriage, your, your work, your relationship with the Lord, your traditions, all of these things that constitute your life has to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit so that you no longer live from that well. You now live from the well that is within you, the Spirit of God that has engraved the Word of God in, on your heart. So that takes time. But more than anything, what we do is we are like that woman at the well. And every day we still come to that same well and we want to draw water from that well. And once we find out that we've kept on doing the same thing, we go into the process of repentance and feeling bad. And that's so fortunate and so amazing how patient Father is with us. So he comes alongside us and he teaches us to surrender. He shows us. And we must be willing that he must show us, when am I drawing from the wrong well? And what the difference is when we draw from him and when he does the work through us. Because the name of the game is surrender. The name of the game is trust. So, Yeshua, the last Adam, is made a quickening spirit and we are in him and he is in us. And we are seated in heavenly places with the Father. And um, let's read Jeremiah 17 because when I thought about Jeremiah 17 with regards to the two trees, um, or let me put it this way, when I thought about the two trees in the garden, I thought of Jeremiah 17 and also Psalm 1, but Jeremiah 17 says it beautifully, and we can see our own lives, how we tend to live um, either from, um, from trusting in man, which includes, predominantly includes our soul, self, which is that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that is trusting self, trusting man, or whether we trusting and eating from the tree of life. Now, the tree of life is rooted and grounded in God's soil of love, but it is also in the living water, the spirit of God. That is the source of the tree of life. That's why it is a tree of life, because that which is life, which is the spirit, is in the sap of that tree. Versus the when we trust in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is man and self, then the source is bitter water. And that water is often our experiences, our sinful nature, our traditions, our way of looking at life. All those things that need to be sanctified. The Lord God wants to bring the axe to the root. He wants us no longer to be partaking of that tree. He wants us to be grafted in completely. And like my previous devotional, in order to be grafted in, you have to be cut off. Everything about you needs to be sanctified and given to him. So let's read it. Jeremiah 17. From verse 5, thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Listen to what that says. Your heart departs from the Lord when you trust in yourself. For he shall be like the heath in the desert. Think of Genesis 1, what the earth looked like. And shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabit it. The earth was void as well. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted 
by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from the yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, and according to the fruit of his doings. So here the Lord God is talking about two trees from which source they, they live from. And then he mentions the heart. Now why does he mention the heart just after the two trees? He mentions the heart because the word says, God the heart with all diligence for out of it flows the, flows the issues of life. Flow. You see a heart pumping the blood. blood. The life is in the blood. What is their life in the blood? Your heart, from which life are you living? And he's saying our hearts are desperately wicked and it's deceitful above all things. He's talking about man. He's talking about the arm of the flesh, trusting in that when we can trust in him. And he says that he tries our, our reins. Our reins got to do, I think it's got to do with the, the liver or the kidneys. It's got to do with your emotions and, and, and your choices that you make. And he tries the fruit of our doings. So that's what the Spirit of God does. He searches our hearts with the light of his word. So you constantly hear these words that I will speak light and life the whole time. So once again, the issue is from which source are you drinking? So what does it mean to drink from the Spirit of God? Well, we know that the word of God is also referred to as water. Um, Paul speaks about the husband that needs to wash his wife with the water of the word. And then later on he refers to the church as well. So the word of God is also water and the word of God is life. And the word of God is truth. And that you will find in John 17 as well. Yeshua told the enemy, man shall not live from bread alone, but from every word that comes from the Father. So, bread is man-made, word from the Father is eternal, it's manna from heaven. He wants us to live from the Spirit. So, formerly, your mind made all the decisions. That's why Romans 12 tells us that we need to um, be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we may know the good acceptable and perfect will of God so this mind of us has always made the decisions but what does the word say in 1 Corinthians 2 the 16 for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him so we can't tell God what to do but then he Paul says but we have the mind of Christ so now we have the mind of Christ which is the Spirit of God so in Romans 8, 14, we hear, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I just want to ask you, when you make decisions in your life, when you need to pray for someone, when you need to speak to someone, when you need to post something or write something, when you need to help someone, do you stop and pray? Do you wait and ask what the Father's opinion is about that person? If somebody offends you and you want to give them a piece of your mind, wouldn't it be better to give them a piece of his mind? Doesn't he know all things? We should stop. The word says you've got one mouth and two ears. I find a bit of sarcasm in that. <laughs> Healthy sarcasm. Um, we need to keep quiet. We need to listen from the Father before we respond. Do not be so quick to give an answer. Do not be so quick. Um, just because you can doesn't mean you have to. We have to learn to wait on the Spirit. We are called to walk by the Spirit. So, in Isaiah 11 verse 2, we read about the Holy Spirit. And let me just read it. In Isaiah 11 verse 2 and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him so it's talking about Yeshua here the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord 
So this is the spirit that rested upon Yeshua. It's the same spirit that rests upon us. So when we read this spirit in Isaiah 11 verse 2, you will note that the word spirit is written in lowercase. And what that refers to is when I say this, someone's spirit, I like the spirit of that person. You are talking about the essence of that person, what exudes from that person. The New Ages would like to call it the aura. You know, who that person, what do you pick up? What do you sense about that, that person? In essence, it is the person's essence that you are picking up. So um, that spirit in, in the Strong's Concordance comes from H7307, which is the well-known word that we know as Ruach or the breath of God. It also comes from H7306, which means wind, but figuratively it's called life. So we remember that um, natural air was breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. But when the Spirit of God comes and brings life into us, we become a quickening spirit. So if we had to take that word in Isaiah 11 verse 2, and we, instead of saying the Spirit, we say the life, which is the same thing, then we have a bit of a, a nicer, not a nicer, it's not the right word, we have a different view on it. It helps us to understand what Father not only have given Yeshua to be able to be the pattern son, what is given you and me? So let's read it. And the life of the Lord shall rest upon him, the life of wisdom and understanding, the life of counsel and might, the life of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So we understand that the Spirit of God is the life or the light of God, that which is incorruptible. And very often um, it's been a debate over and over and over and I wonder if we will ever get it right. Um, everybody has an egg to lay with regards to the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. And this is just my two cents that I'd like to add. Um, when Yeshua was told by the Pharisees that he was driving out demons by the spirit of Beelzebub, he told them that many things will be forgiven them, um, but blaspheming against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven them. And a lot of people see that as when they said that he was um, driving out the demons by Beelzebub, that they were in fact blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which makes completely sense. Um, but I also like to see it in another way. So I'm not disregarding that. I'm just putting another view to it as well. It's almost as if Yeshua was saying, you can talk, say what you can against uh, my father. You can say what you want against me. But let's just make one thing clear. I draw the line when it gets to the spirit. And because there's always a debate about what Yeshua's name is and is not. And I always think of when the disciples, when the uh, Pharisees called him, um, that will say to him that he was driving out by the spirit of Beelzebub. I was thinking that he didn't fall apart. He didn't call lightning from the sky, and burn them to ashes. He didn't he just simply said, don't blaspheme against my spirit. So let's leave it at that. And I find it interesting that when it comes to satanic occults, that um, one of the things they do is to ensure that people will be forever damned, that to do uh, get involved in the satanic occults, not all of them, but it's definitely done a lot, is that they have to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and I think they have to sign a document in which they deny the Holy Spirit. So I find that interesting, the denying of the Holy Spirit. And that's how they... Um, hook them, or at least how they keep them forever damned. But there are those who actually do not do that, and the Father do save them. So the question I want to ask us that we need to think about is, what kind of relationship do you think Yeshua had with the Holy Spirit? And when we ask that question, we need to think of his purpose, why he came. 
Well, we know that he came to be the sacrifice, to be the sacrifice of the covenant of this new covenant that was established that we read in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews. So he had to be unblemished. There had to be no spot or wrinkle on him. The, um, not even in his thoughts. Not even in one thought. What kind of relationship did he have with the Holy Spirit? Now the other purpose why he also came was that he had to represent the Father. He had to reveal the Father to us. And lastly, I'm sure there's more, he had to be the patent son, meaning he had to come and show us how to live life, how to live the way God intended Adam to live. That's why he came as the last Adam. He could have come just as Yeshua, just as the Savior, but Father specifically chose that he has to, had to come as the last Adam to show us what it is to live by the Spirit as God intended it um, for Adam and Eve. So, what kind of relationship did he have with the Holy Spirit? What, what conversations do we think he had in those quiet times where they often hear in the Word that he went aside to go and speak to the Father, wanted to be alone? What kind of intimacy was there? How, how desperately did he cling to the Holy Spirit? What kind of trust was there? Or do you think it was a free breeze? Do you think he just sat there, got his infilling and off he went for the day? Because he told his disciples in John 13, he said, I can do nothing without the Father, just like us. I can do nothing without the Father. Whatever I see the Father do, that I do. Whatever I hear the Father speak, that I speak. And the works that I do, the Father does through me. So, he was filled with the Spirit. So the Spirit was doing all of this. And we do not stand a chance if he still had all these divine attributes. But instead, he took and he stripped himself of all that divine attributes and became the patent son and lived by the Spirit to come and show us how we must live. And I think oftentimes we think, I can never be like Jesus. I can never be like Yeshua. That's not true. Why would he be the patent son if we can't be like him? And that brings us once again to the source from which well we are drinking. And um, I think when I think of the Holy Spirit and our relationship with the Holy Spirit, I think of a marriage, how uh, a couple, when, once they get together and they're married, it's all roses and hearts when they get married the most beautiful thing and they're infatuated with each other and they cannot get enough with each other and then the honeymoon subsides and life has its way with us and it's at that time when you get to know your partner your spouse and you get to know their personality the good the bad you get to know even their tone of voice you get to know and understand when they say something they might say something often but one day they say it in a different way and you pick up in your in your spirit or in your heart you pick up that there was more to that saying than meets the eye or what you heard. Um, you were able to finish each other's sentences. You know what the other person needs with even, without them even asking it. You are able to, in a situation, say your spouse, something happened to your spouse. You are, and it's maybe something joyful or something very sad or painful. You feel it with them. There is such a unity and a bond between you. You're so in tune with each other's emotions and needs and wants that nobody has to tell you. You don't even have to speak one word with each other to know what you need. And you feel what the other person feels. Um, it touches you deeply. That's the type of relationship we are to have with the Holy Spirit. You know, and... Um, The question I want to ask is, how do we treat the Holy Spirit? Um, sometimes, I think I want to use an example here. My daughter the other day, she had, she and I had an argument. Actually, she had an argument with me. 
and uh, she was having a particular bad day and she said some things that could have best be said unsaid, left unsaid. And it was inevitable that I had to punish her or discipline her. And it was quite a, quite a, a punishment, but my daughter's uh, got a very strong personality and she she will uh, fight you tooth and nail and she will cut off her nose to spite her face just as long as she can get her way. And that is very often very bad for her because in the end she loses more than she should have or would have originally. So anyway, I gave her the discipline uh, or the punishment and she just casually turned around to me and told me that no, it doesn't phase her in the, in the least. Now that's a catch-22 situation because I can just make the punishment even worse but because of her uh, disposition to to not care it wouldn't solve the problem and I looked to her and I said to her I wonder what your father would say about that a little card that I took out of my sleeve then don't use it often at all and she turned around and she did not like that idea at all and immediately she said please don't do it buckets of tears and uh, of course I still told her father but the Holy Spirit started speaking to me about that and we know that the Holy Spirit is very often um, concerning the comforter we tend to see the Holy Spirit almost like a mother figure almost like a dove um, the softness of God the love of God and uh, I see very often how we treat the Holy Spirit that way. It was like a mother. A mother, not the fathers don't do it, but a mother forgives and forgives and forgives and forgives and forgives. A mother gives, you know, is willing to uh, do so much for her children. She really lays her life down for her children. Um, a mother is there in the middle of the night. A mother. Um, always gives wisdom, advice, holds, cries, um, teaches. So many people say that the mother is almost like the heart of the house. And yet, so easily, when the Holy Spirit treats us this way, always there for us, always forgiving, when He speaks to us and say to us, don't do that. Don't say that word. Don't watch that program. Please don't post that. Um, how often do we ignore the Holy Spirit? That life within us. How often do we almost make as if we didn't hear it at all? Or we, in, in our heads, think of some way that we can compromise or get ourselves out of it? How often do we just flat out rebel? And we think that we can have this disposition towards the Holy Spirit. It's almost as if we do not respect the person of the Holy Spirit, but only enjoy and value the function of the Holy Spirit, what we can get from the Spirit. And I think this is what Father wants to speak to us about. It's our disposition towards the Holy Spirit as a person. Because the Holy Spirit is never spoken of in the word as it, but always as he is personal. And he has feelings. So I find the greatest miracle for me, yes, Yeshua came down to this earth to dwell on this earth. God with us, amongst us. God literally came down and died for us. A cruel, cruel death. But you know, Equally for me is the miracle that he lives in us, that God lives in us. I'm astounded by that. And when we truly think about that, and we allow the Spirit to reveal that to us, we will be down on our faces. He truly deserves more from us, the Holy Spirit, than we are giving him. So in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17, the word says, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. 
So the other day, I read, um, I read, I was saying up my memory verses. Uh, every day I, I, um, I say up different memory verses. And I just want to encourage you to do the same as well. For the time we are going in, there will be um, a famine of the word of God. And it's going to be a terrible time. There won't just be a famine of literal food, but the famine of the word of God. There won't be paper. Um, there won't be opportunities to necessarily share the word of God the way we do now. The privilege that we have. And the time's going to come where um, that word that you've stored up in your heart will be the saving grace to get you through the most difficult time. Um, I asked the Holy Spirit to show me which chapters he wanted me to memorize. And um, during the course of the week, in my everyday things that I do, I'm busy when I'm busy with the dishes or cleaning house or whatever. I'm always uh, memorizing scripture because I want it in my heart. And uh, I want to encourage you to please do that. It will enrich you as well. So I was memorizing Psalm 23 at the stage. And I came to the part where it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And so when I got to the part where it talks about the rod and the staff that comforts us, Immediately, my mind went to the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And I was thinking, I wonder if there's any significance with the word rod and staff. So, they both comfort. So, both represent the Holy Spirit who comforts the rod and the staff. So, the first one I want to address is the staff. And in the Strong's Concordance, it means to support, to be your sustenance, a walking stick, and it's something that you depend upon. So when I read that, I was thinking of my devotional that I wrote on my blog called, I think that one is called A Limp and a New Name, or is it called Understanding the Ways of the Lord? Can't remember now. But in it, I uh, discuss Jacob that was fighting with the angel of the Lord and his hip socket was touched and he walked away with a limp but he also walked away with a new name as Prince of God and that limp was forever with him so whenever they saw Jacob they recognized him by his limp and I'm thinking that he must have had a staff as well so this is the disposition the weakness that we need to embrace ourselves unable to fulfill the law of God to do the will of God we need to embrace that weakness because in embracing that we will lean on the staff of God then we are called the Prince of God because the Spirit of God then becomes our source. So this is the staff that comforts us, the one we lean upon, the Holy Spirit. Now I had a vision that I want to tell you about that holds hand with this and um, forms part of the disposition that Father wants to speak to us with regards to um, the Holy Spirit, our heart towards the Holy Spirit. So in this vision it was of a little girl I almost saw like a scene of um, very poor situation. I had the idea of almost like a poor neighborhood, like in the Bronx, where you would find lots of flats. And when you walk down the corridor, you will hear as you pass the different doors of the homes, you will hear people fighting and glass breaking, the dog yelping and children crying and swearing and that kind of, you get the idea. So all of a sudden I was inside one of the homes and I was almost like I was just seeing a play or was something playing off in front of me. And I saw a little girl, a little bit of dirty, very sweet. And um, her mother and father were fighting in front of her. She was sitting on the ground, very dirty ground. And um, the father was this big man. He was, um, he had a vest on, hairy, bald, sweaty, foul mouth. He looked like a, just like a horrible bully, putting it nicely now, but he was very really strong and big. And he picked up this little girl and he walked out with her um, out of the room. And I followed them in the vision. And I saw he picked her, picked her down, put her down along the way and he walked into another room, opened the door, walked into the room and 
uh, I knew in the vision that she knew that she had to follow him, she had to obey him because he's angry. So he walked in and as he walked in, this little girl grabbed the door knob and she pulled the door closed and quickly locked it. And I saw her turn around, rushing away. And as she was rushing away and went down the steps that they came up, I saw her under her arm, she had her teddy bear. And when I came out of this vision, I asked Father, what was he trying to say to me? And he said to me, um, even a little child can bind a strong man. And he told me that the teddy bear resembles or represents a comforter. Because your teddy bears, as a little girl, as a little boy, they always have teddy bears. It's almost like the first thing we give our child. Isn't that the first thing we do? Oh, thank you, Father. When we're born again, when we're born, the first thing he gives us is the comforter. So... Here's this teddy bear under her arm and she wouldn't let go. So Father was speaking to me through that little girl and he was saying to me, this is the disposition that I need my children to be in. That they would be so dependent upon my Holy Spirit that they would know it's not how strong they are because I do not expect them to be strong within themselves because they cannot. They cannot do anything without me. I want them to depend upon my spirit. Like that little girl that clutches her teddy bear. I mean, you could take anything from her, but don't you dare touch her teddy bear. So, you know, when I looked at the word comfort, when Yeshua spoke about the comforter, it comes from the word H5162. And like I said, it means intercessor, consoler, and advocate. And when I looked up that H5162, it means to sigh, that is, Breathe strongly, by implication to be sorry, that is to pity, to console, um, to comfort and ease. And isn't that what the Holy Spirit does? At this junction, uh, juncture, I just want to give a small testimony again of my daughter, sorry about that darkness. Um, she came to me the other day and she was telling me about her day. And my daughter has approximately five disorders, so um, it's been a journey. And she was telling me about her day, and she was crying. And that, she does this every day, so um, it's nothing new to me. I am deeply intimate with how my daughter feels. So she was telling me this, and it was nothing new. And I, I knew I just needed to let her tell her story in tell me what she wanted to tell just be an ear to her and not try and fix it and while she was telling me how she felt I started to cry I don't do that often when she tells me because you want to be strong but I started to cry not because I was helpless because I deeply felt her helplessness I felt her sorrow I felt her pain I felt her struggle. I felt her aloneness in the struggle. And the tears just started to roll down my face. And she looked at me and she softened or she just became quiet. And in that moment I realized that just because I felt with her, it consoled her. And in that moment, I knew that it wasn't me that was feeling. It was the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that feels so intimately our burdens, our pain, our aloneness. He knows all things and he lives in us. And I just wanted to comfort you with the knowledge of the Comforter, how deeply he feels with us. So, in Psalm 103, we hear that David says that the, as the Father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And he says, 
He knoweth our frame and he remembers that we are dust. So he pities us. I just want to give you a word at this moment or at this juncture. Let me just get my book out here and read it. I got this word on the 17th of the 2nd. And this word is called me through you. It is never what you can do. And as long as you still think you must do it, you are not one with me. You're still unbelieving. But you have to exercise your faith. You have to do as I tell you. Listen and obey my every command and I will do the impossible. Trust me for the impossible. Act out your faith continually. I am the life in you that will do through you, not you through me. Just like I had to be obedient to my father what he showed me or what I heard. Your obedience is your dependence and your obedience is an act of faith that you trust me for the results. You're not looking to yourself, you're looking to me. You can do nothing. I could do nothing. But I lived by my father and you must live by me. Walk in the knowing that you, that we are one. In covenant where your inability is mine and my ability is yours. The covenant we have is a covenant of faith and faith is trusting me and living by me. This is why you have to be a child. Simple trust, simple dependence, just me through you. Now this video is already quite long and it has another part to it and I just sense in my spirit that I need to end the video here and allow you to just meditate on what father is saying to you personally maybe you can bless somebody else with this video that you know need to hear it and um so i will go on the next video with the with the with the rod so we've dealt here with the staff and let me just finish off with praying father i thank you for your precious precious children that you love so much that you have brought to this video you know who needs to hear this message father and i thank you father that you love them with words that cannot be expressed but something that you do want to express by your spirit you want to baptize them in your love you want them to be rooted and grounded in the soil of the love of your love that they may know the width the length the height the depth of your love that you are able to do super abundantly above all they could ask or think or dream of according to the power that is in them that power of the spirit you've given them their teddy bear their comfort you've given them everything that you've given your son it is not your wish father that they would drink out of the well of man of their own minds their own emotions their soul not to live from their soul but to live from the spirit and you've given them the holy spirit to teach them give them the grace father to learn how to trust in your spirit to allow you to sanctify every area of their life allow the uh, allow the spirit to deal with those emotions to take time to sit with your spirit to ask the relevant questions allow you to heal them when they still need healing to allow you to discipline them by your spirit father you love them you say in your word you discipline those whom you love and i thank you father that you comfort them as well that you feel everything with them and so father thank you that i can just bless them i bless them with your spirit father the ruach that you will fill them afresh that you will comfort them in the moments that they find themselves unable to put one foot before the other, but also that you will strengthen them.
give them the wisdom that they need for the decisions that they need to make. Thank you, Father, just for your love. Seal this video off with your, um, with your blood, and we just praise you and worship you, Father. We pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Thank you for the time, taking the time to listen to this message. It's blessed me to be able to serve, to, serve this to you, and yeah, until next time.